Good afternoon, everyone, and a, a very warm welcome to the Camping and Caravanning Clubs webinar, where we'll be exploring how to earn extra income uh, on your land through the development of a campsite in partnership with the club. Um, first of all, I'd like to do a, a couple of introductions. My name is Simon McGrath, uh, and I'm the head of external communications, uh, external relations and communications with the club, which broadly speaking means I look after uh, PR and media and also government relations. Uh, and uh, joining me today is my colleague, Damien Field, uh, who is the club's exempted camping manager. Damien has uh, over two decades worth of experience uh, in providing guidance and knowledge uh, to, uh, to help landowners establish small and profitable campsites in, in partnership with the club as, as part of our certificated site network. So uh, what I will be doing is taking you through uh, just a few minutes, first of all, um, at uh, going through the uh, going through the slides, just a, a bit of an introduction uh, as to the club itself, our history and credentials, and then I'll have a chat with Damien uh, and uh, basically take you through um, just just a, a, a lot of questions. We've had a lot of questions already in advance, but also we'll try to answer as many of your questions uh, tonight as we can uh, in the best way possible. And actually, we just thought. Um, the best way to really talk, do that is for just Damien and I to, to chat and to talk more about the subject and around the subject. Um, feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, just type them into the into the box at the foot of your screen. And uh, as I said, we'll do our best to, to answer them. Uh, the webinar is expected to last for an hour uh, and it will be available on demand. So you'll receive an email to say that, uh, uh, to let you know where basically when the recording is ready for viewing. Um, so here we go. So I think uh, that uh, if we could go back a slide, I think, can we go back a slide there, please? Just seeing if, uh, unless that's our first one. Um, but um, back in 1901, uh, an outdoor enthusiast named Thomas Hiram Holding uh, basically, uh, set up a, a camp with five friends in Oxfordshire. And that was uh, in, a, in an orchard, a place called Wantage. And he had one simple intention, and that was to enjoy each other's company in the tranquility of nature uh, through camping. Uh, the club went on to uh, form what continues to be uh, a, a membership organization that's very much run uh, in the spirit of holding and what he set out to do. And that's entirely for the benefit of our members. Uh, his mission was enshrined in our Articles of Association in 1947, and, and it hasn't really changed. Um, today, we have um, more than 800 employees who support our members, and they operate nearly 100 club sites. Uh, next slide, please. So... The next slide, where we, when we get it, will be uh, the club's headquarters called Greenfield House. Um, and it's based on the southern edge of Coventry. It's home to our service centre, and that's our service centre that looks after our, our members, uh, and other functions like uh, HR, finance, marketing, and our operations teams. Um, we employ about 600 staff on our sites, working in the field to operate and maintain our network uh, of sites. And we have about 200 people uh, in Greenfield's house, including a 50 strong marketing team. So there is a lot of expertise in our ranks. So the camp, I mean, it's fair to say, I think the camping is extremely popular. We have something like 750,000 members um, and I think that demonstrates just how popular uh, it is. Um, and, and we're seeing uh, a significant amount of new members join us every year. And we always take that as a bit of a barometer as to how well we're, we're doing in, in that respect and, and how popular the pastime is. Um, broadly speaking, we see a lot of campers uh, coming in, a lot of family campers over the summer period. And then in the shoulder months, so the spring and autumn, we see uh, more mature demographic segments and also um, 
quite a lot of empty nesters too outside of the school holidays. And we know that our members love exploring. They love to get out into the countryside. They love being active outdoors. Uh, they love to find new destinations where they can pitch up uh, and really enjoy the countryside that's around them because that's that's a big driver for our, our members. And they want to seek out lovely locations and create lasting memories um, for their holidays ultimately. Um, and we're a club that welcomes all types of campers. So that could be a, a, a backpacker that's arrived at a campsite under their own steam um, to everything all the way really to a, a really, you know, a large motorhome and, and, and everything in between. So that could be caravans, uh, tents, uh, trailer tents, folding campers, that kind, kind of thing. Um, so we've got we've got a lovely selection of, 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 of certificated sites around our network. Um, and um, I think we're having a few little technical issues with the slides that we were going to show you. So we'll just push on. And that means we can just get to the questions and uh, and start um, exploring uh, more of those kind of subjects, if you like, that, that, that we're going to do. But one last thing before I kind of start chatting a bit more to Damien is that um, our certificated site network features 1,200 member exclusive sites that offer a range of facilities. They could be from a very basic campsite uh, to those that are, are fully equipped um, and it's really important that that given we've been helping landowners to realize their potential for more than 80 years now that, that we have a lot of expertise and a lot of experience that you can tap into uh, there's a dedicated in-house team um, at greenfields house uh, that is there to support uh, the owners and, and the managers of our certificated site network so speaking of experts uh, let me introduce you to damien field who uh, i always feel that his his name Name is certainly his surname is quite appropriate to the subject um, and and uh, Damien and I've worked together for 15 years uh, he's my go-to person when it comes to anything that I need to sort of find out about the certificated site network and it can be it can appear to be a really complicated subject so we really kind of uh, wanted to have that chat and just to kind of chat a bit more about some um, some key kind of things that, that that people have been asking us there's lots of questions already that are starting to come in um, and, and as we go, so if, uh, yeah, we're going to dive straight in, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, my first one, Damien, is um, I just really want to cover off some of the basics. So can you explain to us uh, what actually a certificated site is? Yeah, no problem, Simon. So yes, certificated site, um, a CS as we call them, um, are small privately run um, campsites businesses. They can accommodate up to five caravans or motorhomes and up to 10 tents. They're for members of the club only. Um, that's a legal requirement. Um, and it's for basically recreational touring purposes. That in a nutshell is what a certificated site is. Okay, thank you. So it's a question that, we, that we've uh, we've had in from uh, Gordon Chitty. Uh, he's asking the, the kind of following question, but what are the minimum requirements for a certificated site? Yeah, so it's half an acre is the minimum uh, acreage that you need. Of It basically needs to be level as much as possible um, and campable land. Um, it ideally needs to have safe access. It's one of the biggest things um, for members, as you can appreciate, they're, they're bringing in their pride and joys. Um, so they want safe access um, to, uh, especially when leaving the site. So we look for uh, unrestricted views to the left and right, ideally 100 metres, but in places like Devon and Cornwall, we know we're not going to get 100 metres. So it depends on the access road um, and how busy it is and so forth. Um, in addition, we uh, need a chemical disposal point, which is, tends to be an underground cesspool, so no outlet, whatever goes in has to get pumped out. Uh, two water points, one drinking water and one rinsing for the uh, rinsing the toilet cassettes, uh, both with non-return valves on. Uh, dry waste, um, i.e. a bin that's regularly emptied, um, and uh, not last but not least, uh, public liability insurance, which I know I think uh, one of the questions is later on um, is about insurance as well. Okay, yeah, the, the, there's a lot, a lot of topics in there. So, okay, that's that's a good good start. Um, so, if you like following that same theme, I think uh, Michael Watson is wondering um, what the requirements are for the provision of toilets and washrooms, things like that. 
So actually, for a certificated site, you, you don't need to offer toilets and showers. Um, however, saying that, um, there are many, many sites. And actually, um, in terms of toilets and showers, we've roughly got speaking about 50% of the network offer toilets and showers and some description of some quantity. So you don't actually have to provide it um, for the numbers that we've got. But if you do want to provide it, that's always a benefit for campers, especially if you're looking to have the tents as well and they want to be there for a week or two, they will look for sites that have got toilets and showers available. Okay, that's that's uh, that's helpful. So I think we, we use the term quite a lot, uh, certainly at the club and certainly when we're talking to uh, prospective certificated site owners about that, that word uh, exemption. So can you tell us a little bit about what is an exemption? So yes, so um, we've got a specific exemption um, the organisation has for uh, against the site licensing requirements of the Caravan Sites and Control of Development Act 1960. Um, and also this, uh, a very similar exemption for the 1936 Public Health Act, which covers the tents side of things. Um, and that is what the exemption is. And it basically allows organisations such as ourselves to set up certificated sites without the need to obtain planning permission um, from the local authority. Um, it changes the use um, from whatever the land is, so arguments take agricultural, um, agricultural reasons, um, to recreational touring purposes. And that's what the exemption is, and that's how we use it. Okay, right. So, I mean, you, we talk about planning, um, planning uh, law requirements there, that sort of thing. We've had a lot of questions. We've already seen questions come in uh, live around that whole subject. So, uh, again, uh, Eugene Amara um, wanted to know um, where does planning fit into the equation, and is it an onerous process to go through, and, and how long will it take? So, there's a there's a few questions in that one. <laughs> No problem. So yes. So in terms of, as I say, uh, in terms of actually setting up the certificated site, you do not need planning. However, um, lots of local authorities, different local authorities, interpret the legislation different and the exemptions differently. So what we would always recommend is, for example, when you're putting the basic requirements of a cesspool and drinking water and so forth, is to always double check with your local authority just to make sure that they are seeing off the same hymn sheet that you do not need planning to put it in. Um, if you are looking to provide additional facilities, such as toilets, showers, uh, internal tracks, all that kind of stuff, the odds are you're going to need planning permission for that. Um, so we would always recommend before doing any works on site to speak to your local authority to ascertain if planning permission is required, because the last thing you want to be doing is doing any works for them to come out, come out and say that you needed planning in, in the first place. In terms of um, how long it could take, um, it all depends on the local authority and obviously in the backlogs and so forth but generally speaking we don't hear too often that um, landowners having great difficulty in terms of obtaining plan permission but that falls within the specific la the local authority okay so as much as uh, we might have exemptions planning permission really is an important factor to consider and to to, to put into the as part of the, the overall kind of uh, scheme of things absolutely cool okay thank you so we got a question here from Colin Rayner, uh, who, who's, who's sort of saying, how do they deal with planners? What, what's, you know, I suppose it's just that mechanics of getting in touch and, and so on. What would you suggest there? Any tips? So um, a lot of local authorities quite happily to have a, a conversation with you before you even start putting a planning application in. So what we always recommend is try contact the local authority first, and I'm sure they'll be absolutely happy to have a conversation with you and, and highlight any issues that, um, would come up straight in the first instance. Another option is to speak to the specialists, you know, planning consultants in your area. They will be used to dealing with the local authority and will know who to speak to directly. Um, so, it, you know, they are the experts in terms of planning. So definitely recommend seeking a local one there and, and getting their guidance from them. Okay, sounds like good advice. Um, and I suppose this is, a, is a, again, it's a related question, uh, for, but Gary, Gary Cooper's been in touch to say, are there restrictions around uh, the vicinity of neighbouring properties? So I suppose it's considering what your neighbours uh, are doing with with your plans in mind. 
So yes, yeah, so in terms of part of the application process, um, when our site officers come out to see uh, the landowners, is looking at neighbours neighbouring properties. Now, as an exempted organisation, we do have the responsibility, duty of care, to consult with any neighbours who we believe could be directly affected by the establishment of the CS. So as part of that application, we will assess that and we will notify them by a hand-delivered letter that gives them the opportunity to consult with us um, and raise any comments or questions that they may have. Um, in terms, you know, every every uh, situation is very different um, when looking at a certificate site and where you are and what the uh, how close neighbours are. So there's no set guideline, but obviously, you know, you need to consult with the you know as part of that. We'd recommend speaking to the local uh, local neighbours just to see uh, what kind of opposition you're going to have. Right. Okay. So you know, good relations with your neighbours is is important in any any Absolutely. kind of uh, walk of life. So uh, setting up a certificated site is no different. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's interesting, we're getting some uh, live questions in around the subject of, of how you go about the process of setting up a campsite uh, in areas of outstanding uh, natural beauty and also national park areas. We'll come to some of those in a moment. Um, I've, we've got one here from uh, Harry Bowler, who's um, talking as well about I think what broadly speaking, what, what the difference between a certificated site is, Damien, and also a pop-up campsite. And again, we're seeing quite a lot of questions coming in using the terminology of pop-up campsites. So can you tell us a little bit more about those, please? Sure. So, um, yes, yeah, so over the last couple of years, the term pop-ups of uh, campsite has been coming up more and more. Um, and generally speaking, it, this depends on the, the country that you're in as well. However, it tends to be just for tents. And it tends to be, um, and every landowner has the right, in theory, to do this um, for up to 28 consecutive days or a 60 day calendar, uh, 60 days in any uh, calendar year. Uh, the best thing to do really is, in terms of a pop-up for tents, um, is to speak to your local authority again to understand the jurisdiction on that and, and, and any restrictions in the area. The main difference between a pop-up site and a certificated site is CSs, a uh, certificated site, is operating under our exemption um, and, and as such is a, an established campsite um, and is not temporarily a uh, temporary basis. It generally operates between the main camping season um, and, and can be, depending on uh, certain uh, uh, stipulations, be open all year round as well. Okay. Thank you. So coming to that subject of uh, AONBs and national parks, um, so, and it's an interesting subject this, uh, we've got, are there restrictions depending on how your land is listed if it's in an area of outstanding natural beauty or a national park? And Richard Knox here is sort of wants to know how planning permission uh, differs, if you like, within uh, in the context here of, of Dartmoor National Park, for example, while uh, Martin Sutcliffe is asking about it in the context of of, uh, of an area of outstanding natural beauty. So yes, obviously um, there are some very sensitive areas in the UK that we have to be mindful of. Um, it's not an instant um, uh, an instant stop to an application. Um, but obviously the club has to uh, consider those sensitive areas. And, uh, and, and in, in terms of, we will continue with the application, speak to the local authority, um, be mindful of visual impact to the surrounding area um, and any comments that we receive from the local authority would be generally looking about visual impact on the, and additional screening might be required. So what I guess I'm saying is it's not an instant killer to the application, but we have to jump for a, a few more hoops. Okay, so again, if you're in that, if you've got land in one of those areas, um, it's something very much to factor into your thinking initially. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's really uh, really important. So, okay, um, if you like, that's a lot of sort of fairly basic information to, in a nutshell. So, what, how would you describe the steps, if you like, to setting up a certificated site? What sort of process would you go through, you know, succinctly, if you like, to do that? So if you're interested in setting up a site, um, the best thing to do is just go online, um, setupasite.co.uk. Um, there's a, a simple, quite simple form to fill in, shouldn't take you any more than 10, 15 minutes. Um, and we ask very specific questions as well, what kind of site you're looking to, to, um, to develop with us. Um, once we get the application, you'll be uh, handed over to a, a specialist advisor. Um, who will be your point of contact going forward uh, until it's established. Um, 
if everything checks out okay and we do our proximity checks against other certificated sites, existing certificated sites, because we don't want to saturate an area at the end of the day, um, we will then send a site officer, a local site officer, um, to visit uh, the area to assess its suitability to become a site. And as part of that, we'll be looking at things like road infrastructure, uh, visual impact, um, neighboring properties, all those kind of bits and pieces. Um, they will be delivering the hand delivered letters if, if they feel it's um, suitable. Um, and then from that, um, we will notify you from head office um, in terms of going through whether we, we, it's something that we can go ahead with the application or not. Um, I should say that that is after a 28 consultation period with the 28 uh, days, 28 days with the uh, uh, neighbours and also the local authority. Again, with the local authority, we're not looking for permission, but we do speak to them again about the uh, any objections or comments or anything specific about the land. Um, all being well, and if we issue with the work to be done as we call it which is the list of developments if there are any um, which gives a default by six months to get the work done um, once you've done that um, let us know in, in terms of you've completed all of those works and we will come out reassess everything make sure everything's okay make sure you're happy as a landowner and have everything you need um, in terms of operating the certificated site and if it's all good to go we'll issue with an annual certificate and it's as simple as that there you go and that's it in a nutshell wow okay so um no that, that's really interesting i mean there's 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 a lot of process in there clearly but also damien there's there's just that underpinning a lot of what you're saying is just talking to people whether it's planners whether it's neighbors it's good relations you know it's making sure that you're getting people on board explaining what what you what you're planning to do and that kind of thing and i think that that's got to be a really really good ad, ad, advice so so okay then what i mean i i've got a camper van uh i i love getting out and about uh i've been to uh you know quite a few certificated sites over the years but i'm interested to to hear from you actually what what do you think makes a good site what makes a good certificated site uh, I think if you can get a, a plot of land that's got a rainbow going straight into the middle of it and at the bottom of it is a pot of gold, I think you'll always <laughs> onto a winner. Um, but I what makes found that, yeah. I no, no, nor have I, nor have I, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but uh, what makes a good site is a very good question. And there is nothing as a perfect site. There are hundreds of thousands of members for the Camping and Caravan Club, and they are all very different and all want this, you know, very different things. I think the best thing to do is, is first of all, assess your access into that site. Um, as I said, I think at the start is that members are bringing their pride and joys and they're spending thousands of pounds on those units. So look at access, make sure it's good. There's no potholes, all that kind of stuff and easy to get into the site. So good access is definitely a, a one to look at. Um, and then um in terms of you know is the level is the ground level are you going to be able to maintain it the facilities that you're going to produce and have um keeping those to a good standard it doesn't have to be a fully fledged you know singing and dancing site we've got hundreds of sites that are just basic sites that have got the basic uh, basic uh, facilities and they are very popular so it is a bit of a, an open-ended question um but i think main thing is is keep it maintained enjoy winning the site and the members will pick up on that and they will go again okay no that's 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 really interesting because and again it's the access thing as as someone who has a camper van myself i do you know the the access i suppose once you come off the, the highway the road uh you know and going through the site so whether it's through a farm uh, uh you know a farmyard if you like to get to the certificated site for me it's 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 ensuring it's kind of nice and flat that i'm not bouncing around too much if i'm towing a caravan that you know you, you kind of don't want to 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 pitch up and and, and be thinking oh, okay I've, I've lost uh some of the crockery out the the cupboards kind of thing so it's a nice flat site i think that's that's really good it kind of brings us to uh one of these other questions here if you like um from uh ralph uh beavers um who has some lovely dales in in his neck of the woods by the sounds of it but so does does the site have to be flat Ideally, yeah. I mean, I'd love it to be flat, um, but we know everywhere UK is not flat. It has to be campable at the end of the day. Now, if you're in a caravan or motorhome, you have the facility to obviously, you know, level it up to a certain degree and have your, um, your trucks in there and everything else. Um, if you are looking to provide tents, obviously, you don't want to be too much of a slope um, because, you'll, you know, you'll wake up on the other side of the tent in the morning. Um, 
but yeah, so a level as level as possible. Um, I know some sites um, that's not always possible, um, and they do look to potentially terrace into the land and have pitches, at, uh, you know, at a, 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 a terrace level pitches. But again, just be mindful that that is, you know, civil engineer works and again planning in terms of the local authority. Okay, no, that's good. Um, so uh, we have one here. Um, what are the benefits uh, and what can I expect to make financially? And I think that's a question from um, Harvey Blackmore, who's, who's keen to find out a bit more about the financial side of things. And, and um, um, you know, and, and there's another one here from uh, Thomas Annette, who's, who's wondering whether the profit is worth the time versus the effort. So uh, obviously really good questions, those ones. Yeah, definitely. So it is hard, you know, to say how much money you're going to make um, at the end of the day, because they're all private businesses um, and we don't um, ask for the records on that. But what I can say to you is, is that based on a full site, so 15 units, um, roughly speaking, around about 1750, which is on average what a, a price per night uh, per unit is, um, based on the between March um, and October, which is the main camping season, you are looking, roughly speaking, at about what 220 nights. So roughly speaking, just over 57, 58,000 pound based on, you know, full occupancy at the end of the day. Um, so ho hopefully that gives a bit of a, a guideline there. OK, because um, that that's, uh, brings us on to a to an interesting ex other other point here. And that's to do. I mean, so so that's the you know, hypothetically what you could make from uh, sort of the, the, the pitch fees that you charge. Um, but what about the extras? What about the secondary spend element, Damien? What, what, so, yeah. You know, so it could be things like, I, I suppose, uh, if you're going to hire out barbecues, for example. Um, um, and that's actually a question from uh, M, M. Shakespeare. So what can you tell us about that side of things? So, a lot, yeah, absolutely. Secondary spend, um, and most businesses will uh, uh, do that and need to do it. Um, it just tops it up there. So anything from um, a lot of sites do fire pit hiring and the, and the packs of firewood um, in there as well. You've got um, farmers shops. Um, you've got the, a lot of them have uh, B&B, so they offer the breakfasts as well. Uh, we've got a few of those and they're very popular. Um, again, unique selling points are things like if you've got bike hire, um, especially if you're an area of outstanding natural beauty, members want to get out there and, and view that area. So definitely, and there's nothing specifically stopping you from doing secondary spend and, and definitely something to look forward to. Okay. So I, I must admit, I mean, f for me, um, uh, again, in my experience of using certificated sites, there's, there's one in particular in the Cotswolds that I, that I, I went to last month, uh, a lovely site. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's on a farm and it's got a farm shop. And, and I really, really enjoy kind of spending a bit of time uh, going in there, looking at the produce. I know it's local produce. You know, I see something I buy I, and I really enjoy taking it back to the, my camper van. Uh, cooking it on the barbecue and, and and as well this particular farm shop also sells some uh, some fantastic local beers from from local microbreweries and uh, and and that to me is is just bliss um definitely a so, yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah i couldn't couldn't agree more um so we've got a question here in from uh, uh, alan herbert who's, who's just asking is 70 i mean you mentioned 1750 uh, is that for tents or camper vans or both is that a charge per pitch if you like i think is the question so um the easiest thing to do uh, for landowners is just charge the per unit per night. Um, now, at the end of the day, it is a privately run um, certificated site business. Um, and pricing wise, you know, it's up to the landowner what they want to charge. So, you know, if you've got some unique selling points, um, you may be able to charge more um, or, or potentially, you know, on the other, uh, other side of the scale as well. OK. So we've got to, again sticking with the kind of the, the the funding side, the income side of things. Uh, we've got a question uh, from from Julia Mitchell, and she's asking: Is there any funding assistance that's available at all? And and, and would that also perhaps apply to yurts or or cabins? Would they qualify? So I suppose that's the glamping element. Yeah. So it's a, a, a yes, it's a difficult question. I've got to be honest. Um, but in terms of uh, grants, I think that again there are. The, we will try and help you as best as we can. Um, however, there are specialists out there, consultants that look at um, grants and assistance that you may be able to obtain um, as landowners. Um, and I, I'd always recommend speaking to you know those kind of specialists in the first instance, just to give yourself a bit more of a you know an insight into your business model. 
Sure. A sort of a nice broad picture and, 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 and work out what you think is right for you and, and, yeah. and, and, and the site. Okay. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. Um, okay. So uh, in terms of uh, still, still on the financial side of things and, and associated costs this time, uh, Richard Foreman uh, wants to know um, more about the cost of services, if you like, and, and things like sewage connection charges and that type of thing. What can you tell us about, uh, about those associated costs, Damien? So, um, very difficult one again. Um, it oh, all depends. On, <laughs> that's right? uh, it all depends on um, what the kind of facilities you're looking to provide. So, for example, electric hookup is the prime one, um, and it's very, you know, it is going to be one of those questions that you have from land, uh, from from members. Do you have electric hookup? All depends how far away uh, you are from the transformer. Um, again, it's uh, cabling, uh, the armoured cable that can cost again. But it also, on the good side of things, is that many many landowners can do a lot of the works themselves so to try and keep the cost down if you can try and do as much labor as you can that's always a winner um but you know it i can't unfortunately tell you how much it's going to cost for electric because it, there's so many variables on it but the best thing to do really is again try and get some quotes initially um speak to the power distribution uh, board um, in terms of getting quotes again things like you know do i have to put another transformer in or do i have to go underneath a, a local road or something like that the best thing to do is get those quotes and see where it is um, i think you mentioned about sewage again um uh, uh one of the basic requirements is that you have a an underground cesspool um which we look at about a 600 to 800 gallon tank um the bigger the less time you're going to have to empty it so um and you know again speak to some local cesspool um companies tankers uh, to see how much they charge okay so on on that same uh subject we had a question in here um uh about compost toilets actually and obviously thinking about sort of sustainability elements but are compost toilets acceptable on a certificated site yes absolutely if it's if it's one you know going back to careful around the area and all that kind of stuff you can absolutely have compost toilets um it's not for everyone um um you know um everyone has their different likes and dislikes but it is definitely you if you wanted to do that that's definitely an option okay that's good thank you very much um so just kind of you know, uh, obviously, we're, we're tapping into an awful lot of your expertise here, Damien, and I'm certainly learning a lot as I go along already. Um, but just say, talking about the club here, um, how does the, the club, if you like, support our certificated site owners? What, what sort of services does your team provide? So for the if once you become a certificated site, um, we have a specialist team for you um, open there, you know, Monday to Friday. Um, if you've got any issues or, you know, uh, with the wealth of uh, experience, uh, we've got the local site officers as well. So the ones that have come out and see you, um, they will also come out on an annual basis to um, come and see you, see how the site is doing. Um, and they've got a mountain and all years, decades worth of um, experience and what other sites in the area are doing as well. So they're a mountain to, to, to tap at, a uh, mountain of knowledge. Um, and as I said, um, with the specialist team that we've got, we're always happy to take on those calls from you or emails from landowners and assist wherever we can. Okay, no, that's that's really good. So it's about tapping into that expertise and knowledge, as as, as I said at the beginning. I mean, we've been doing this now for um, for 80, 80 plus years, so it's it's significant knowledge that we've, we've built over that time. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, so uh, we've got a few more questions here that, that, have, that have come through. Um, we've got one about from Sue Gray. Uh, do we? Do you have to provide power to each tent? Um, and John Croxford wonders if you need to provide electric hookups at all. Uh, and he, he, so he's a farm manager, but looking at this, and the farm is pretty much at its power limit by the sounds of that. So um, some sort of specific questions there. But what can you what can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I mean, at the moment, um, we've got about seventy percent of our CSs have electric hookup. Now that all ranges from different power um, supplies. So uh, I believe that new installations have to be um, set up for 16 amp, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to provide that 16 amp to the camper. Um, got those sites out there that are offering, you know, six amp. You, 
you know, the lower the ampage, obviously you potentially have more problems on site um, for tripping um, from, um, you know, uh, kettles and so forth. Um, but you don't, you know, that saying that you don't have to provide um, electric hookups on sites. Uh, members have got generators, they've got solar panels, they're used to it. Um, so don't feel that you know if the if the cost is astronomical to get electrical hookup in there don't don't worry too much about it. as i say we've got hundreds of sites that are uh, non-electric and they are very popular okay so that kind of uh, uh in it uh, sounds like it answers the next question a bit really which we've got one from uh, wendy vickers that's that's you know their, their farm also doesn't have a great electricity supply what can you suggest is you know it, it could be that that actually you don't necessarily have to provide right. hookups is there anything no. else beyond that that you can you can? I think, like I say, that you know, campers are used to some certificated sites not having the electric hookup. So that you know, and the facilities this day and age are getting better and better in terms of solar panels and and members are you know once they're getting onto CSs they're used to their units and what they can get away with in terms of operating on the battery or gas or solar yeah. panel. Yeah, I mean, take my example with my camper van. You know, it's got a leisure battery, so I know that actually I can go to a greenfield site in effect and 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 operate the van uh, using that. I've also got uh, two gas bottles that that will help me. Uh, you know, they can power the heating, they can power the fridge, and, yeah. and it can power the cooker as well, of course. So, yeah, um, and that's all part of that kind of knowledge that that people just build up themselves as they understand more about about the types of camping units that, that are out there on the on the market okay so so we mentioned earlier uh right at the start something about insurance so uh catherine paulson would like to know more about uh insurance for certificated site owners and, and how that works so yes so it is a, a basic requirement you have to have public liability insurance it covers uh, yourself and it covers the members and their units um the club has got an insurance arm to it, um, Club Care Insurance, um, which uh, offers landowners uh, a bespoke package um, specifically for certificated sites. But saying that, um, a lot of uh, a lot of landowners have uh, public liability insurance already. Uh, a lot of them being, like for example, NFU, and we know that NFU um, are quite happy to provide uh, uh, an extension, if it will, or um, onto their existing policy for a, min a nominal fee. Okay. All right, but, but it's 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 essential. But it you know, there, there's 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 a lot also to consider in in that. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a I think this is a really interesting question. Next one. So um, and it's one we've seen a few times that's uh, come through. Um, so uh, Daniel Bland wonders whether there is a legal need to have a campsite steward or staff members on site at all times. That's a good one. It is a good one. <laughs> yeah. So um, we do have those sites that the landowners are, for argument's sake, a couple of miles away down the road. Um, and that's perfectly acceptable. It's absolutely fine. Um, a lot of members are used to it, um, you know, um, and you don't have to be there 24 seven. What we do say is that as long as they're contactable at the end of the day, because you never know what's going to happen on site. Um, and as long as they can get hold of you and if needed, that you can get there in a short, relatively short period of time, that's always beneficial. In an ideal situation, yes, absolutely. We'd love you there, but we know that's not always the case. So that don't, if you don't live on site, don't let that put you off. Um, part of the application um, online application that you that landowners fill in there is that question is just to say do you live on site or not and what's the distance between and how are you looking to um, run the site are you going there daily and you know do you have animals to care for for argument's sake which is a lot of the, the lot of the reasoning that we get from landowners so yeah basically don't worry about that too much okay all right thank you uh, so we've got another question here actually uh, a couple of contributors George Eccles um, and David Coates both asking about the requirements, if you like. Now, we touched upon it a bit earlier, um, but the requirements of traffic and access considerations. What, yep. what, what, what sort of what would you be looking or what would you be advising uh, landowners if they're, they're looking, they're joining that path, if you like, to set up a certificated site? OK, so um, especially in the rural areas, I think um, in terms of access, you know, a lot of the roads are going to be single uh, single carriageways. Um, and yes, that can cause um, difficulties for some, some members to get in and, and off, especially if you meet someone coming in the opposite direction and having to reverse. So what we would ask is if it's single carriageway, that there are appropriate and relevant passing places, you know, long enough to get a car and a caravan, if it's that type of site that you want to go down the route of. Um, because what we don't want um, is 
you know that landowners taken the time and the expense to set up a site um, and then unfortunately have problems with members getting on site and having potentially negative reviews and all that kind of stuff so it's again before you know setting up a site look at your access look at realistically but saying that if the site is not suitable um, for a car and a caravan we could look at um, alternatives so for example would it be a great site to have a tent only site or a camper van and tent only site so usually there are ways around it depending on what type of site that you want to operate okay so there are options and basically you know get in touch with yourself and the team and and, and talk it through Absolutely. yeah we're happy to that's... take any calls <laughs> there you go well that's good <laughs> Excellent. I know that's a really good question, that one, actually, because, again, as a camper van owner, um, that whole access side of things, uh, I mean, I've 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 driven down uh, narrow lanes in my camper van. I'm also towing a caravan and, and it is quite a uh, quite a fraught moment, if you like. And, and, and actually, you're going on holiday, you're touring, you want to enjoy yourself and, and arriving on a campsite, you know, slightly tense isn't isn't the great way to start something. So so chat chat to us. And we can all again, looking at. Um potentially like arrivals before um, arrivals after two and departures before noon kind of things is try and limit, you know, units coming into each other at the same time, you know? Okay. So, I mean, we've talked a bit there about camper vans and, uh, and so on. So um, we've got a question here. Uh, Therese Robertson is, is a farmer who's wondering whether there are different rules for camper vans when it comes to pitch provision. I mean, can a pitch, I suppose, you know, is a pitch usable by, all manner of different types of camping units, whether that's a, a t- you know a tent, a trailer tent, a, a, a caravan, or a motorhome. Yeah. So I mean, apart from as we said at the start, um, generally speaking, no, it doesn't make any difference. Um, more so for tents, again, for the for the sloping element of it. Um, what we would tend to say is for camper vans, uh, motorhomes, and caravans to be, whilst you can have them mixed in with tents, is obviously have the tent slightly aside because obviously with camper vans, you know, visiting the local area, going in and out all times of the day, it's probably best to separate it slightly, slightly there for obvious reasons. But generally speaking, no, it's absolutely fine. To, you know. Okay. So uh, we have a question here uh, from Yvonne Dyke, who says, uh, now she's an experienced campsite owner. Uh, we established our site in 2012 uh, with the help of the club, um, for which which uh, we're extremely grateful. But but do you think there is a danger of making it sound too easy? Uh, because uh, Yvonne says it, it certainly isn't. Um, perhaps the first question a landowner should ask themselves is, am I customer focused? So uh, what, what's your what's your thoughts about that, Damien? Well, first, I, I think I spoke to Yvonne um, quite a few times during 2020 um, in terms of trying to help out in terms of what was going on at the time. Um, so I hope I hope you're doing all right, Yvonne. Um, so in terms of customer focus, I think absolutely in this day and age, you're running a campsite. Yes, uh, members know what they're doing and all that kind of stuff. But you have to be customer focused. That's not to say that, you know, you have to be on call 24 seven and have to be there and with them all the way through. Um, I think generally a nice welcome. Um, and putting yourself out there for the members, making sure that they're happy, making sure they're content and got everything they need, um, that you've done, you know, you're welcome. And I think that's on on the best setting, that's the way forward on that one. So generally speaking, yes, you're operating a business. Yes, they're members of the club, but you're operating a business and you should definitely be customer focused. Okay. So, and that's an interesting point here because we've got a question in uh, from from, uh, Ben Addy. can uh, you men- mention members there? Can non uh, club members go on to a certificated site? So um, it is actually legislation that the exemption for a CS certificated site is for members of the club only. However, the good thing is that you can join non members on site. It's a, a, a brilliant uh, recruitment commission uh, for landowners. Um, every time they get a member, um, they get the commission base for it. And it's, and it, it, um, but as long as they're members before the night, before they pitch, that's absolutely fine. Okay. And, they so could that, join, and they could join online as well. Right. So that, that, that you know, we talked about secondary spend earlier. That absolutely. could be uh, an additional uh, uh, form of income, if you like. Um, so uh, we've got a question here uh, from Alison Turner. Um, how much does it cost to set up a certificated site? I suppose that's a big, quite a, <laughs> quite a big, broad uh, question there. But um, is, are there, is there any general guidance you can give there, Dan? Yeah. So um, a few years ago, um, uh, a survey of um, existing landowners, uh, certificated site owners, um, 
kind of like recorded that it was round about between three and five thousand pounds um for a basic certificated site now obviously as everyone's going through at the moment with the cost of living and then everything else contractors pricing going up that might have increased slightly over the last couple of years but generally speaking that's the kind of cost you're looking at depending on how much again how much work you can actually do yourself um but if you are looking to then have electric hookups uh hard standings roadways all that kind of stuff um obviously that's when you you your costs are going to go up um but the good thing is is that you know the more the facilities that you have the more unique selling points on that site sure you know at the end of the day you you're quite adequate to to charge more for that facility and members are more than happy to pay that as well for that extra facility on site okay that's interesting and then and then um so we've got another question here uh uh and i think it was something actually you talked about earlier about this proximity check. Um, so we've got a question from Charlotte Green who says, does it matter if a small holding farmer nearby has a caravan site already? What how does that come into play? So part of the internal checks, first of all, when you, when when the landowner has submitted an application, we do a proximity to other certificated sites and our own club sites. Um, generally speaking, um, if there is another certificated site within two miles um, and they've been set up in the last uh, five, six years or so, um, that would probably be, a, a, but unfortunately be a non-starter because what we're trying to do is protect those existing certificated sites and give them a geographical area. But that's not to say that it potentially can't go ahead. We would look at the area, if it could warrant another certificated site, um, what the attendance figures are, um, and and again, a type of site as well. So some a site down the road might be an adult only and only having uh, motorhomes for argument's sake, uh, and a new one might be a tent only or family friendly completely. So again, looking at different options in terms of sites. So it's all what I'm trying to say is at the end of the day, um, Every situation is different. Yes, we do check proximity and we've got some, um, uh, but we could quite happily, when we do speak to landowners about it and the, and the reasons why or we can't or, or and all that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you. And, and, and we've got a question in here um, as well from uh, Richard Deakin. Uh, it's a very similar subject actually. What happens if the neighbours object to the land being certificated? What, what sort of can you advise there? Yes. So um, as part of that consultation, and we do get those neighbours, uh, local residents that, you know, aren't necessarily happy about a campsite in the local vicinity. Um, and what we all tend to do is explain to those residents what actually is a certificated site. A lot of people out there think it's going to be a big commercial campsite. Um, and that's not what CSs are about. They're small CS is um, members uh, appreciate the countryside code and local note, and they're generally very quiet. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think I think, <laughs> and and for me, I think you know, as a, as a CS user, um, you know, I, I, it is I, I love finding those little hidden away sites sometimes that that are maybe just on the edge of town. Um, so they're sort of, you know, they're still country, you know, in the countryside. It feels nice and rural and tucked away. Um, but actually, uh, you know, my wife and I, we love going for walks. So, you know, having a town or a village nearby that we can walk to, uh, to, you know, to get to go to the local shops, the local pub is is, is great. So, uh, so that's kind of, you know, f for us as as, as campers, as as, as camper vanners, it, it's a really ex ex important experience for us. But obviously, everyone's different, as as we've said. Um, so, okay, so we've got a we've got a, another interesting one here. Um, and that's a, a round um, from, uh, well, it's, I suppose the question is, is everyone booked in advance? And is that, how is that done? Is that through, a, is, yeah. is that through the website or, or, or how do you go about, how does a, a, a member of the Camping and Cabinet Club go about booking a pitch? Uh, right, so yeah, site. absolutely, that's a very good question. Um, so we, the club, will advertise your certificated site to our member database. Um, that will be online, um, in the Site Seeker Handbook and on the app as well. And uh, we will promote uh, your direct contacts that you choose, um, whether it be, uh, you know, mobile, landline, whatever. Um, and members will call you, uh, the site owners, directly to book. Um, we, um, yeah, so yeah, the call up directly with the landowners, book direct, and it's the dealing is between you two. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so uh, we have a question here from Jess Allen, um, who says that, that you know, you've mentioned uh, the issuing of the annual certificate um, in the first year. So what happens in year two? Is it the same process 
for renewal or is it a simpler process or how does that work? So, um, yeah, so the certificate, the exemption certificate lasts a year from um, and we generally uh, resend those out um, roughly about mid February. So you should get it by the 1st of March. Um, but generally speaking, those are renewed. Um, and unless there is something specific about that site um, or something is not happening that it should be um you will you know there's there's no reassessment if you will other than the annual assessments that the site officers go out to but you know i could count on one hand how many times a landowner hasn't done something or done something very wrong that would stop a certificate being issued okay so um that's, that's i think that's a yeah that, that's an interesting uh kind of point really um so we we have another question uh is it a OK, it's about taking, you know, if people turn up and they haven't actually booked onto the site uh, and is that uh, this is from uh, David Lee's uh, Millet and is it ad inadvisable to take unbooked people? So in other words, I think we call them off roaders, off -roaders uh, if, yeah. if, if they, you know, they're just touring around, they they maybe use uh, our website or one of our uh, kind of uh, campsite guides, if you like. Uh, our site seeker book is, is a primary one. Um, and they just want to tour and they stop up and, and, and so what's your approach there is, is that yeah. is that fine that's absolutely fine um so part of the application and, and get certification is to have a uh, massive a3 site entrance sign that promotes the site um and and uh, you know the club um and as you said um simon that that there are many people that go touring. Um, generally speaking, this day and age, um, I'd be surprised if they just pop in, to be honest, with mobiles and all that kind of stuff. They will generally call up in advance, say, look, have you got a pitch for tonight or for the next yeah. couple of nights? Um, because they don't want to turn up and, and it could be late at night um, and they don't want to turn up and not have a pitch. So generally, they will the members will call up just to double check. But in essence, no, that's absolutely fine. As I said, member, it should the, the site is for members only and all of them have a, a card, a membership card, or it be uh, electronic digital card so the landowners can check that they're members of the camping and caravan and club um, and you and you know that they're going to abide by the t's and c's and and your own cs internal policies as well oh, okay no that's good um so we have a question here how how many days a year can you open Oh, good one. So <laughs> gen generally speaking, now it's, it is a good one because our lovely British weather um, obviously isn't always the best in the winter. You, you mean um, the sun doesn't always shine, Damien, is what yeah, you're trying to say. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you, in theory, yes, you can open between, let's say, March and September, October, the main camping season, if you will. But if you want to operate an all, all year round site, that's absolutely perfectly acceptable. Um, but we would look to see if it's suitable. So, for example, obviously with the ground, what kind of like drainage has it got? Has it got suitable for motorhomes? Because they're all, you know, not all, but the front wheel drive, you know, is there a track? Is it slightly sloping? Um, is there decent gravel, hardcore on the entrance? So when they come off the main road, they're not going to automatically sink. Um, again, open all year round, potentially you might want to look at having electric hookups because it's not always, uh, you know, <laughs> A bit, a bit cold at night um, <laughs> but generally speaking yeah you absolutely if it, it is a possibility for landowners to have an open all year round site okay no uh, 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 that reminds me um i went uh, out in my camper van earlier this year and um our electrics were wasn't working very well shall we say um and it, i think it was i think it was january late january and it was exceptionally cold and uh but we we, we, we stuck it out but i you know hardened was, camper simon hardened absolutely camper. Yeah. It, it was it was a it was a long night um <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've got one here as well um this is an interesting one i'm also conscious of time uh here a little bit but is there a cost uh to be a certificated site uh, and is is there a fee to be listed with the club Okay, that's, yeah, that's from uh, Rachel Wrightson. Cool. Um, so yes, there is a fee. Um, uh, it's an, uh, every t basically one hundred ninety-eight pound, including VAT, is the total cost, and that's every two years. So we don't charge that until you get certificated, because there's so many hoops that we go through, um, and it's not always set in stone that you're going to become a certificated site. So once certificated, we'll charge you one hundred ninety-eight pound, and that covers every two years, and that covers the annual visits, the certification, all of the work that we do, and all that kind of covers a little bit of the expenditure of the site officers going out there and and doing their annual visits and so forth. Um, so that's every two years i have to say that outside of that we don't take a penny um so that that uh, um and um yeah and that that's it 
Okay, because that was an interesting one there. Uh, another question I saw a moment ago was uh, as around, does the club take a commission on bookings? No, no uh, commission. Okay. No commission. Um, our motive is to get uh, certificated sites for our members, places for members to camp. Um, but you, the landowner keeps all of the money they make. Um, okay. As I said, it's just 198 quid every two years. Right. Okay. That's that's good. That's a really important point, I think, actually. It's mm. good to know. Um, so uh, James Griffin here has been, has been in touch. Uh, we following up on the on the point about neighbors and and can a neighbor actually block uh, a certification of a site so what we what you have to consider is that if for argument's sake um if your campsite is surrounded let's say worst case scenario surrounded by neighbors um one of those things that we look at is okay realistically um are members going to be welcomed in that area um, if they go to the local pub, um, are they going to be welcomed? Um, because what generally you've got to be mindful on is that um, members that might go have a fantastic time. The, you know, the landowner's lovely, the site is lovely, um, but they got a hassle from neighbours or something like that. And, you know, in this day and age with reviews and all that kind of stuff, you just have to bear that in mind. But that goes back to where um, we said at the start in terms of see what kind of... Um, um, see what kind of uh, relationship you've got with your neighbours and speak to them about what a certificated site is. Okay. So again, it comes back to that, you know, just, just being open and honest about what you're planning to do. Talk to your neighbours, get on well with them, get them on board. And, uh, and and the same applies to the planners as well. It's, it's reaching out to people. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we have um, an interest. This is an interesting question. It's about um, signs. So are there ever issues with the signage and advertising regulations from the local authority so i suppose yes we do have uh signs that we correct if i'm wrong damien but we can provide a certificated site owner to obviously say this is where you are uh are there any kind of uh regulations involved in that or concerns from the local authorities perspective so yeah so generally speaking i mean again it's very very rare that we actually hear any issues on this side and Generally speaking, it's not something that landowners should, um, should be worried about at this stage. If um, we provide a site sign, a site sign, um, and generally it's on the main entrance to on their land. Um, however, if there's a local policies, um, the local authority will highlight that to us when we are consulting with the local authority. So, um, but it's a good question. It is a good question. Okay. No, that's that's uh, that's yes, because I must admit. I, I... On my travels around the the, the the length and breadth of the country, I, it, I'm amazed at just how many times I spot the club's logo on a on a certificated site sign somewhere, uh, or usually in lovely places. And I always try to think I've got to remember to come back here at some point. Um, okay, we have. Um, let's have a quick look at this one here. Um, so this one's interesting from from Alan Herbert, who's saying, "Can you have a cutoff time for people booking on?" onto a site uh, so you don't get bothered if you like in the evening so you know obviously you, you want to have your evening or you know night time uh, what would you say about actually people arriving on site um so yes so a lot of landowners what they do is for people that have booked up um is provide them for argument's sake uh, with the pitch number um, and they have a board on there saying your pitch number one or whoever it is, um, and the pitches are labelled out so that way they know where they're going. Um, in terms of entrances, a lot of them have a, a number changeable padlock on there, and they give the member that number so they can get on there. Um, and yes, that's absolutely fine. Generally speaking, campers tend to arrive before eight. Uh, um, excuse me, before eight um, eight pm, um, not to get too late in the evening. Um, and again. It, you know, it's bearing in mind that certain uh, situations that, you know, if traffic or something like that has stopped the member getting there um, earlier, but generally members are quite considerate and will let the landowners know. Okay. No, that's, 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 that's good advice there. Um, so I've got, a, uh, again, just a little bit of conscious of time, uh, but I've, I'm finding this fascinating. So many questions have been coming in and they're really good uh, and some some really informative answers. So thank you, Damien. Um, so this this one here is uh, in the context here that, that they're part of a tractor club and can they offer a rallies, if you like, with more pitches? 
So what can a certificated site do to maybe have a specific camping event there by the sounds of it? Yeah, so a lot of landowners will know and have heard of um, caravan rallies. We call them meets and temporary holiday sites. Um, and as long as you've got additional land, um, so it, so if you've got a field, field number one, we'll call it, um, is the certificated site. If you've got a second field that's got a permanent border um, between the two, um, then you can operate um, rallies um temporary holiday sites and meets um for exempted organizations and there's roughly speaking about 400 organizations out there that have got these specific exemptions to operate temporary holiday sites or meets on their land and that's a great way of landowners earning that additional money um for potentially a field that's not being used um and the joys of our uh, local groups as we call them operating those events is that they they know what they're doing um it's minimal hassle to the landowner um and you usually get one point of contact the, the site steward if you will um and they will look after the group um and at the end of the day uh, as i said minimal hassle for the landowner and a secondary income coming in there okay right uh here's one from uh tony french uh how do people pay for their stay so they've turned up on site they're looking forward to a nice little break how do you know what are the mechanics of that transaction so um it depends on the landowner and what they want to do um so a lot of them take cash um they can do online payments um but a lot of them have got the uh, credit card terminals as well that they use on site so it's up to the landowner up to the site owner how they want to take that transaction um as i said we, we don't get involved in the tra transaction side that's all between the landowner and the member okay that's that's good and uh we got uh i think we're gonna uh take this last question this is actually quite a specific question but it's an important question if you're looking at the the size the plot of land that you've got um what distance do you need to have between each tent or i suppose in that sense tent caravan motorhome um i suppose the question really is what's the distance that's that we would require between each pitch so um, the club industry leader um, and what the recommendations really is in the in the, um, in the industry is that there's six meters in between um, each pitch. So that is a com the six meters between the combined unit. So whatever that combined unit is, so it could be a caravan, an awning, motorhome, an awning, or just a big tent. Um, from the edge of that unit, the combined unit, six meters uh, fire safety gap until the start of the next pitch. Now, I should say that that's not to say that you have to demarcate the pitches. Uh, the, um, there are many, many hundreds of sites that just have the grass uh, grass field. And as long as they uh, ascertain that they've got six meters for the next pitch, that's absolutely fine. But if if more, if you've got the space, great as well. But um, in a nutshell, not less than six meters. OK, no, that's really good to know. So I think um, I think, you know, that's pretty much all we have have time for tonight. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd say thank you to everyone for, for sharing the questions. We uh, um, it's been a fascinating set of questions, those submitted in advance and those those this evening. So thank you, everybody, for listening and taking part and engaging in that. And, and thank you, Damien, as well, for your, your time. And, and I think one of the things that I've I've learned tonight is that, the, you know, not just that the club has so much um, experience if you like 80 years worth of experience of, of of this type of setting up this type of campsite but but actually the knowledge of yourself and the team i mean that's that's been phenomenal um I, yes i've certainly learned a lot today um the webinars i mentioned earlier the webinar recording will be uh, available soon on demand and you'll get an email to let you know when that's ready uh, for viewing um if you'd like to know more about setting up a certificated site that we haven't perhaps covered upon already or you want to look a bit more in, in detail at a subject, um, you can download our free guide, uh, which covers all the information um, we've just discussed tonight, as well as the next steps to take. Um, just visit uh, setupasite.co.uk for more information. Um, I think it's fair to say that Damien and I hope you've had a really uh, informative and useful evening um, uh, that, that you've kind of left left us, if you like, with a greater understanding of the topic. Um, it is complicated, but it's also, you know, what we have is a huge amount of experience and expertise, particularly the expertise part, which which I've learned from from Damien tonight and that, and that we've given everyone some really good food for thought as to setting up a certificated site, uh, seeing what you could do for your own individual businesses, uh, including ideas around sort of secondary spend. Um, 
So it's a huge thanks from both Damien and I uh, for joining us uh, this evening. And um, yeah, please do do get in, in touch with the club. Uh, thank you again for listening. Thank you.